Okay, so um, welcome everybody to our webinar, uh, November webinar. Unfortunately, we've had some technical problems where it seems people are having troubles um, logging in. So we're going to record um, this conversation with Stephen Tang, and then we will put it up on our website and um, parents can will be able to be inspired by Stephen um, many times over, I guess. Um, let me introduce you to um, Flora and Stephen. So Flora is going to be in conversation with Stephen. Flora Chan is um, joined the board of Aussie Deaf Kids um, about a year ago, I guess now. Um, Flora is the mum of three young boys and her youngest son, who's four years old, um, was identified with the bilateral sensory neural hearing loss through newborn hearing screening in Victoria. Um, she is a professionally, I guess, she is a um, public health practitioner, a health coach, and a mental health first aid instructor. And Flora will be chatting with the inimitable Stephen Tang who you will learn more about over the course of this conversation. Um, parents often tell us that interviews with young people who are deaf or hard of hearing really help them to realize the possibilities for their own children. So I think everybody's in for a treat in this conversation with Stephen Tang. So Flora and Stephen, I am going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Anne. Just wanted to thank you for, yeah, organising this opportunity for us to hear from Stephen and having just an authentic conversation um, so that we can have, just get a bit of insight um, into things and have a bit of fun. So, Stephen, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for taking the time and thank you for, um, you know, your thoughts in, into things. No now, worries. Glad, glad to be here. <laughs> Yeah, great. Now, just to begin with, do you mind just um, just tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, um, as stated before, my name is uh, Stephen Tang. Uh, currently, I'm 21 years of age, and I'm also currently studying uh, a Bachelor's of Speech, Hearing and Language Sciences uh, at Macquarie University uh, over here in Sydney. Um, so I'm also looking to complete a master's in uh, clinical audiology after that, but uh, we'll get to that um, a little bit later on. So myself, I've got a bilateral, moderate to moderately severe uh, hearing loss, uh, bilateral, bilateral meaning both ears, uh, obviously, and uh, I've been wearing hearing aids all my life. Uh, so now I'm 21 and they were fitted around two and a half so you can do the maths there uh, I believe like 18 18 and a half uh, years um, and over time I've seen technology uh, improve uh, immensely so um, yeah that's a little bit about my uh, background um, I've ob obviously uh, gone down the uh, spoken language path with um, auditory verbal therapy uh, as well so that was conducted uh, locally here uh, at the Shepherd Centre, uh, and that was conducted from the ages of two and a half till five years old. Um, but yes, that, that is a little bit about my background. That's great. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to find out a bit more about you, actually, <laughs> believe it or not, tonight. Now, just winding back a little bit to your early life, let's just start at the very beginning. Um, so... Do you know much about how you were diagnosed? Because um, I believe it was before when they did, before the universal newborn screening that's happening right now. So can you maybe walk us through what you, well, you wouldn't probably have remembered, but what you know of your diagnosis and things like that? Sure, sure. So uh, back, back when I was two and a half, um, obviously this was before the universal newborn uh, hearing screening program or SWISH. Um, here in New South Wales was uh, being actively uh, rolled out, um, which means that, yes, unfortunately, my hearing loss 
uh, was undetected. So to this day, we don't know if uh, the hearing loss was congenital um, or developed afterwards, uh, but we, we do believe that it was most likely congenital. So uh, my parents, uh, especially my mom, I believe, uh, noticed that I wasn't, uh, you know, babbling uh, and or responding to different noises uh, around the house. So that sort of was when the suspicion was uh, raised. Uh, we had an awesome uh, pediatrician who, you know, she was able to ask a lot of questions about. And from there, I was then referred on to an EMT and ultimately to uh, Australian Hearing at the time, now here in Australia. Uh, and after that process, the diagnosis was pretty quick from what I understand. Uh, and it only took a few months for me to be, uh, be fitted bilaterally with uh, hearing aids. Right. So you went, did you go straight into early interventions after that or, or how, how was the process back then? Yeah. So the process back then was uh, kind of twofold. Obviously you've got the ENT side um, who works closely with the pediatrician. And then we had the Australian hearing side as well. So uh, they both provide uh, the family with, you know, a mountain of resources. Uh, from what I understand, though, uh, Hearing Australia, uh, Australian Hearing, uh, they they had a brochure, I believe, or it was a personal recommendation, maybe, uh, from the audiologist to reach out to the Shepherd Centre, who um, we we then promptly, you know, uh, reached out to, and you know, within you know not a very long time, I was over then at the Chatswood uh, Clinic, Linfield maybe. Um, and, you know, the rest, is, the rest is history. Yeah, that's great. Actually, that, your process, even though it was before the, uh, the newborn screening, is actually quite similar to when my son, except he got, you know, discovered in, in the newborn screening. But, yeah, they, they do get onto it quite quickly. If you don't mind me probing a little bit, um, do you, did you, has your parents ever shared with you how their feelings were at that time of diagnosis or what kind of went through their minds at that time? Yeah, so definitely um, at, at the time, it, it's never an easy conversation uh, to have. And it's never a, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, uh, positive almost. Uh, it's never really positive uh, when, you know, uh, clinicians have to break the news. Um, obviously, my parents uh, had a flurry and flood of emotions, and along with that came, you know, a mountain of doubt and uncertainty that uh, really uh, almost, you know, dictated their view of my future. Um, but as time went on, uh, the the outlook slowly slowly changed. Um, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge that, yes, there will be a period of grief. There'll be a period of doubt and there'll be a period of, you know, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my parents certainly weren't immune from that at all. Uh, and back then, you know, they luckily had the support networks in, in place to to deal with that, as well as, you know, the professional medical community who was there to guide them through it. Um, I know nowadays there's, you know, different groups and from what I've had the, the, the privilege of, you know, discussing with, you know, other parents through my various roles. Um, it, 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 you know, even to this day, it's, it's never gotten easier. So uh, it, it's definitely still a, a process that, you know, parents have to work through and, it's important to acknowledge that uh, the feelings that they have are completely valid, but it's also important to uh, take a step back and really look at the uh, infrastructure that we have in place nowadays and, you know, see what the correct, you know, uh, choices are. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's actually so, so rewarding to hear you say that because being a mum that has gone through that, um, not, too long ago with my son being four 
um, definitely the the feelings and the emotions uh, are you know are valid. Um, but as you said, I think even at at four you know four years uh, moving on, it does it does um, I wouldn't say subside, but I suppose it you know you have a different you have a different perspective sometimes as as time continues. Yeah. So we've got a uh, a question from Bruce um, here saying asking what are some of the major issues that your parents faced in helping you in your early years were, were you told of any so I know for a fact that um early like early on um the I would say the main issues were uh most likely to deal with uh you know uh themselves you know um when it came to it their support network and the professionals around them gave them answers, uh, you know, to many of their questions. Uh, but those answers would be more so like, you know, how much can he hear? You know, um, can you break this down for me? What does, you know, this diagnosis mean? What does this word mean? Uh, and it'd be like, you know, oh, how do I, you know, operate, uh, you know, this equipment and that and this and that. But a lot of the time, uh, especially back then, um, a major issue was that the other factors of hearing loss weren't necess uh, necessarily uh, treated, shall we say. Um, back then, audiologists would tend to treat a patient based on their audiogram. That's it. Um, nowadays, we know that, you know, hearing loss can affect, you know, social uh interaction social well-being it can definitely affect mental health um and i think my parents just didn't get a lot of support when it came to these other factors um hopefully that answers your question um i'm sure there'll be more detail given later on as well yeah no i i think it's it's great that um as the son it seems like you, you now you've got an awareness of also what your parents gone through and i think that's mm. that's you know that's really good um now just moving a little bit forward into schooling because i think for parents um that have joined us and even for myself i'm i'm really curious as to um how you navigated schooling and especially with technology um you know i think schools these days you know they're a lot more inclusive um when it comes to all kinds of um you know disabilities or you know things like that and definitely compared to when I went to school, it was, it's a lot more, um, there's not a lot more knowledge into it, but can you run us through how you kind of, I suppose, introduce technology to schools, teachers, and, you know, the, the society that you had to belong to as you started education? Sure, sure. So uh, the journey of schooling for me uh, started um, at Newington uh, Lin Linfield, which is um, which was awesome. I, I went there from kindergarten till year two. Then furthermore, uh, I then moved on to Barker College, which is located up uh, near Hornsby here in Sydney. Um, and I attended there from year three all the way till year 12 to complete my HSC. So obviously on that, uh, that whole uh, journey, uh, technology did play a vital role uh, in it. Um, I'm, I don't think anything has changed too much since I've been out of school. Uh, but back then, I used to use a uh, FM system, which um, I'm sure some of you guys would be very familiar with. FM, also known as uh, Roger, I believe nowadays, uh, most likely would be what you guys know, know it as. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can all see me uh, in the like recording or not, but uh, something like that would be what I use, a re remote microphone. Uh, to this day, I still use it for uh, university. Um, but back then, uh, obviously it was a lot bigger than this, uh, but um, it was just one of the many tools that uh, I employed during my time at school. Uh, going to Barker, I, I was very fortunate. They had a awesome support network uh, in place as well. Um, they had a whole, uh, kind of faculty almost, no, that's probably not the right word, a whole team uh, dedicated to learning support. And uh, my itinerant support teacher, as well as my parents, 
uh, worked hand in hand with them to ensure I was getting the best support. Moving on, the other bit of technology that I used was a sound field system. So not as common, but I'm hoping that you guys know what that is. Uh, basically, it's very similar to a Roger or a, uh, FM system. Uh, however, instead of going directly to uh, my hearing devices, what it would do is it would go to a lab speaker uh, placed at the front of the classroom and or around the classroom and basically provide a better signal to noise ratio for uh, the entire class, whether they had a hearing loss or not. Um, when it comes to other strategies that were employed that weren't uh, necessarily technology, um, I'll, I'll elaborate on this further if you guys want, but um, at the start of every year, uh, something that was very helpful, especially in the later years of high school, was a uh, general kind of meeting, which involved me, uh, my parents, my internal support teacher, as well as the learning support coordinator, um, which basically would uh, disseminate the message across to all my teachers uh, for the various different subjects in high school or back in junior school where, um, you know, I wouldn't need to change, uh, change classes. It would just be my uh, everyday teacher. Um, what we discussed in these kind of meetings was, you know, how I felt I was coping. Um, my feedback, was uh, generally taken, as well as um, different strategies, uh, you know, being raised by different uh, individuals. Um, and as much as I hate to admit it now, uh, those meetings were very, very helpful, mainly because they got everybody on the same page as to uh, what things we would use uh, throughout the year to ensure I was learning my best. But it also held me accountable um, and taught me how to self-advocate. So whether that uh, be, you know, raising my hand if I didn't hear something, um, I now know that, you know, everybody knows, my teacher knows, the support coordinator knows, my parents know, my general support teachers knows. I can't, you know, pretend that I didn't hear something. I can't, you know, be complacent and just sit idly by when, you know, I might miss something. Uh, I can't say that, oh, you know, I don't want to use my technology uh, just because, you know, I was self-conscious. I can't say that because I did promise to, you know, my teacher at the uh, start of the year that I would do this. Hence, it held me accountable. Um, but that's just some, some a, a very small snippet into some of the things that, you know, I did throughout my many years of schooling. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that <laughs> kind of touches on your point there. Hopefully, yes, no, definitely. I think I think you you've um, highlighted a lot of things. But I think for me, um, what I heard most from from your response was the amount of self advocacy that um, you put in place. And we'll we'll touch in. I'll, I'll ask. I've got a question for you for that. But I'm just going to um. There's a there's a question that's come through by David, and he was interested about how you feel about the term hearing loss, um, given that children born without hearing, he says, hasn't lost anything. So. Oh, right. Yeah, no, no. I, I, um, that is a very interesting uh, question. I, I feel like that question touches more on the idea of, um, say, deaf culture, or maybe uh, how we feel like we want to be represented. Um, I'll, I'll start off by saying that I don't speak for anyone else. My experiences are completely unique to me. Um, and I don't, you know, just cause someone else will be okay with, uh, you know, a certain term doesn't mean everybody is. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, how I personally feel about hearing loss, I just see it as a, a medical term, you know, I draw no offense to it. Um, the only thing, I guess, from my point of view, as I've gotten older, is understanding that, you know, hearing impaired might not be as acceptable nowadays, and I can completely see why. Um, I am studying, you know, hearing and, um, 
you know, the, the science behind it. So when people say hearing loss to me, all I see is a medical term. Personally, do I believe that, you know, um, I've lost something or that I'm disadvantaged is that, no, I, I honestly don't because I know for a fact I wouldn't be this driven, I wouldn't be this passionate, and thirdly, I wouldn't be this successful if it wasn't for my hearing loss because I would have gone down a completely different path. So um, I, don't think, yeah. I don't think I've lost anything. Yeah. yeah, no, I, 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 I think I feel the same way um, regarding my my son's um, hearing loss, I guess. Um, and, you know, hopefully one day he'll he'll sit in a position like you and be able to share his experience as well. And I thank you for for answering that, because, yeah, I think it's always good to be able to um, know your views and, and like you said, they're your views. Now, just touching back on your self advocacy. Um, so when did, what's your earliest memory of when that started? And, and do you think it's something, is it, was it a skill that was taught to you or do you think it was just something that just came naturally to you or is it a mixture of both, you think? Oh, I'd say it'd be a mixture of both. Um, you know, I've got friends who I've known since uh, year three. Those, those friends uh, would definitely tell you that, um, in the early years, I, I never mentioned uh, my hearing loss. I never made a big deal of it. Um, and granted, it probably wasn't, you know, the in, in hindsight, yeah, it wasn't the best thing to do because certainly I, I did miss out on, you know, the punchline of many jokes and, uh, you know, there was a, a, a sort of a misunderstanding, you know, among my cohort. Um, and uh, I, I think, yeah, coming back to what you said, it, it'd be a mixture of both because um, over time I learned, you know, uh, what should I do? How should I self-advocate? Uh, but I also had a very pivotal uh, moment uh, in my school and career. Um, and if you don't mind me going off on a bit of a tangent, uh, back in year... Year six, I believe. So the last last year of uh, primary school, um, my internal internal ed support teacher had the brilliant idea of organizing a um, kind of presentation to the entire like year group, uh, basically covering my hearing loss without uh, explicitly asking me first. Um, which, you know, in hindsight was a absolutely uh, masterful thing to do. Um, and in that presentation, I, I didn't know it was like coming. Basically, you know, we finished one of our uh, everyday classes. They walked in. I'm there going, I'm there giving him the uh, side eye going, why are you here? Um, and they get up the front and, you know, so like, hey, you guys might have seen me around, you know, um, da, 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 I'm, you know, this uh and i'm here to talk to you today about you know hearing loss and all that uh needless to say i got roped into it pretty quickly uh i think that was their plan all along and basically we uh that day we covered you know what is hearing loss what's it like to have a hearing loss and you know what strategies you can use to uh help someone who has a hearing loss understand you better um, we also had many different uh, different activities, you know, um, a hearing loss simulator, um, what's it like to hear through like a hearing aid or something. And uh, the the uh, class favorite was um, actually a demonstration of uh, the FM system or Roger system, you know. Uh, they'd be given a pair of headphones and I'd have the task of going outside and saying like a secret message oh into the uh, remote microphone and they go oh my god i can hear you wow this is amazing um and obviously as the presentation went on i got more and more comfortable um with you know the idea of okay yeah i i do have a hearing loss and you, you know what yeah this this might actually help and um for the rest of the year dude, my cohort uh they were so supportive um, if I'd missed something or if someone had thought I'd missed something, 
you know, they they suddenly nudge me like, did you get that? And I was like, oh my god, you guys get it. This is amazing. Um, and whenever I, you know, leave the classroom, go get something from my bag or go to the bathroom, honestly, within like five seconds or something, the uh, kids at the front of the classroom would, you know, scamper up to the uh, teacher and just go, hey, hey, Steve, Stevie, can you hear us? Hey, hey. Um, and I, I, I'm just there trying to focus on my own thing, you know, outside of the classroom. I'd be going to the bathroom, you know, I, 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 I'm just there going, you guys serious? And I couldn't <laughs> help but, you know, laugh to myself every time that happened. Because honestly, every time I, I left the classroom, you know, it'd be it'd be amazing. Uh, but yeah, but yeah I class that as you know the pivotal pivotal moment when, uh, you know, I was no longer self conscious, I guess, about he- having a hearing loss and going that you know what, um, all all these worries, you know, that you know, my parents had that I had, um, was just completely nullified. You know, kids will you know, obviously be sceptical um, or, you know, question things that they don't completely understand. But if you've got the ability to explain what a hearing loss is and what all this technology does, they completely understand it. And kids will be kids, you know, they'll they'll have an absolute great time with it. Yeah, that that's, that's so great to hear. And that's such a lovely story. So would you say that like having that positive, almost first moment of self-advocacy do you think that really I suppose gave you the confidence and the drive to to keep self-advocating for your you know for for your hearing loss I think a better way to put it is that it gave me an understanding of everyone else's point of view and from there it was relatively easy to um, develop a the self-confidence that I have today it was relatively easy to go, yeah, it it, it, it is for me. It, it's not for anyone else. It's for me. Um, and, you know, to this day, I still, you know, I still partake in it, you know, day in, day out. <laughs> not like I've got a choice. So uh, it, it seems like yeah. you love it enough to make it a, a career now. So <laughs> you're not running away anytime soon. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's move on a little bit. Let's beyond the primary school kind of early education years and moving towards you know teenage years and maybe even into uni when you have a bit of independence and I think uh, for the parents you know for myself and then for the parents with the younger kids it's it's good to actually dream about the day where we can maybe you know be a bit hands-off on on some of the the things so can you remember when around what age or what time did you find yourself kind of saying to your parents possibly hey mom I got this you know I you know I'm, I'm cool with you know the technology I'm cool with these appointments or you know I can chat to the teachers myself you don't need to come to every meeting for instance was there was there a time like that or are they still yeah yeah, yeah no, no, <laughs> there, there, there definitely was a time like that but um it came at different times for different uh different activities shall we say um I I guess uh, in hindsight, I had always been interested in what the audiologists were doing. So um, I'd say from the age of 13, maybe, um, maybe even 12, um, I would have been completely okay to, you know, take an audiology appointment by myself. You know, I, I had complete control at that point of, you know, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Um, so in, in that instance, yeah, I, I, I kind of took control of my own hearing. You know, not everybody has the um, ability to dictate what they want and don't want to hear. So um, I will gladly take that ability. Um, in terms of schooling, however, um, it definitely came a lot later than 12 or 13. Um, throughout, throughout high school and, you know, especially towards, uh, the early days of high school, um, as I was moving, you know, through my teenage years, um, I wouldn't say that I was a model student by any, by any means, you know, um, but I think that, that, to be, to be clear, that had nothing to do with my hearing loss. I think that's just your, you know, your general teenage, um, 
edginess, your general teenage, you know, uh, rebellious nature of going, oh, I, I don't know if I want to do this, you know, oh, it's it's okay, don't worry about it, see you later, mate, um, all, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I'd say, you know, by the time I was in year 11, year 12, um, I had full reign and um, over my education, uh, but that also meant that I had full accountability over my education as well. So um, when it came to stuff like that, yeah, I, I put it around that age, you know, 17, 18, maybe 16, um, if they're really, you know, a good student. Uh, in terms of employment, et cetera, um, maybe starting a career, uh, I'd say um, for one reason or another, I, I I decided, you know, really early on that, you know, I I, I want to be independent. Um, I think it was because I knew that, you know, I I had been lucky in, you know, my my uh kind of upbringing and you know my access to support services. I I, I kind of went, you know, I I I should give back, um, in a way. So by the time I was in year eight nine. I kind of had my heart set on becoming an audiologist. So from there, it was pretty straightforward. I already had the connections since, you know, I, I am hard of hearing. Uh, duh. I, I had people in the uh, industry that I could reach out to. So from there, I kind of started to build my professional presence. Um, and, you know, as time has gone on, it's, it's only kind of, you know, built up more and more. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. So I suppose... Were there a time like during schooling or even your independence that you felt your hearing loss caused struggles in any way? Like, you know, we don't want to paint the picture of, you know, obviously Stephen being just all unicorns mm -hmm. and rainbows <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> all things lovely, which I'm sure you are. But, you know, like every colourful life, I think there's there's different, different colours. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. was there anything that you might remember you know, that, that you struggled with that, you know, that you think maybe other people may struggle sure. with? Sure, sure. So, um, I'll, again, I'll break it down into the uh, three categories, you know, one being school and social, one being employment, and the other being, uh, what was it? Shoot, it's left me. Uh, it's evaded me. Uh, I'm sure I remember. I'll get to it. Anyways, um, when it came to school and social, as I said, um, I wasn't the best student, nothing to do with hearing loss, you know, the support was all there, all good. Um, but another aspect of school, you know, comes uh, that comes with it is the social aspect. And for the most part, um, it was absolutely amazing. It was lovely. I had great friends. They appreciated me for who I am, you know, just a fun, loving guy. Uh, but back in, back in junior school, uh, you, uh, still sticks out to me to this day years five and six, I had a pretty bad um, falling out with a very good friend of mine. Uh, and in hindsight, I can definitely attribute it to, you know, myself uh, having, a, you know, a bit of a hearing loss. Um, and again, I, I touched on this a little bit before, but um, a large part of hearing loss that isn't, you know, treated or acknowledged by professionals is the fact that it can impact the social aspect of someone's life. Um, and it was, to this day, it's still the only friendship that, you know, has ever turned sour um, because of a hearing loss, you know, whether it be directly and or indirectly. Um, and it, it, it wasn't great, but uh, I definitely, you know, had, you know, a support network around me at the time, which, you know, definitely helped me through it. Um, and the, you know, like, for, for example, you know, I, I had my itinerant teacher who I could reach out to for support um, in that instance. And, you know, the the, uh, the teachers, you know, at my school, as well as the itinerant support teacher knew that, you know, I was more than, uh, you know, responsible and mature enough to have them tell me to my face that, you know, um, I think either you didn't hear this from them or that you weren't picking up this social cue from them. And granted, yes, it hurt at the time, but 
uh, I definitely, I even back then, I definitely appreciated them telling it to my face. Um, again, I'm not here to you know paint that you know everything's going to be rainbows and unicorns and absolutely amazing. Uh, so I'll just give you a um, quick example of you know when when it's not been you know so great or so ideal. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know we we live and we learn from experiences like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, another one with uh, let me think, employment. Uh, nothing negative. I get it. nothing too negative. Uh, we'll we'll get to employment a little bit later, I'm sure. Yeah. But there was this one time I was on the phone, had a uh, had a parent that I was talking to who had a uh, a child who you know had a hearing impairment as well, um, and I was I was maybe I was having a bad day, uh, but I just I could not for the life of me understand what they were saying over the phone, uh, even with all my amazing tech, and it was just I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Um, and it got to the point where they were so frustrated. They're like, ah, it's, it, it's okay. And don't worry about it. Um, I'll call back later or something like that. And um, like they, they didn't get angry, but it was probably the only time uh, in, in my work that I felt disappointed in myself. And I went, ah, oh, damn. You know, if I didn't have a hearing loss, I wouldn't have this issue. Uh, so that, that was the only time. Um, but yeah, no, I I think that's that's probably probably about it. Uh, I I can't think of what that last category is at the moment, uh, but that's I'm okay. sure it'll, it'll it'll come up. It'll come up. Yeah. If they always do. Yeah, just out of curiosity though, like when you go through moments like that, when you know, um, as you know, as you said, you know, after that phone conversation with uh, you know with with that mm -hmm. parent and things like that, and you had that moment of oh I wish I didn't have the hearing loss you know how do you I'm just curious as to like how do you resolve that in yourself you know how, how you know how do you live another day afterwards kind of thing yeah, yeah uh for me it was pretty you know pretty darn simple I hung up the phone went to get a cup of coffee and bang straight uh, I'm back there um no I'm kidding it, it, it's not that straightforward <laughs> but um it I I know for the rest of that day I, I was kind of you know uh, I had a moment of um of doubt, I guess. Um, personally, it was a uh, or I, it wasn't an easy conversation to have for myself because um, yes, I was younger back then. Uh, I was probably more immature, uh, definitely, and it was a lot easier to just blame stuff on myself, but. Uh, over the week after that conversation, I, I know, you know, most people don't get hung up for a week over a phone call, but um, now nah, for me, it was, uh, I, I was able to take a step back and kind of look, um, because one, one morning I walked into the office, you know, uh, I was able to say to myself, hang on, you know, you work for a multi-billion dollar company, you're following your dreams, you know, you're handling millions of dollars in products you're you're making a real difference you know for 99 percent of people who ha are going through what you're going through um and after that i had the biggest smile on my face going you know what i i think i've done pretty pretty darn well you know mm. um i don't know anyone else who's in my position so yeah it was one day yeah you know and um you know, if it's any console, consolation, I, I, I did fix their issue eventually. Um, but yes, uh, yeah. I, I was able to take a step back and go, you know, look at, look at how far you, like, you have come in life. And I think uh, if, if a parent is able to instill that kind of mental thought process in, uh, in their children, it, it, it goes a long way. You know, it, it goes further than you really think it would. Um, because they're able to apply it in so many different aspects of their life. Yeah. So that's that kind of follows my next question is that when you do have those moments where you doubt yourself and your abilities and and you know even I suppose your purpose in in what you're currently doing or the task that you were doing, what would you 
recommend like say as a parent how if I saw my child you know like it, you know experience that it what would you want us to I don't know say or do or you know I'm just really curious as to if, if one day that happens to my little one what, oh. how, how how can I be there for him you know yeah yeah um so in, in terms of you know any doubt um that a child has growing up you know every child will have that doubt um, you know, whether they have, you know, a hearing loss or not. Um, but in terms of having a doubt uh, due to their hearing loss, I think what really, really helped me was uh, being able to see that there were other individuals who have a hearing loss who have gotten to where I wanted to go in life. I've met so many audiologists um, and people who work in the field who have a hearing loss. And, you know, I might be uh, stuck on, you know, whatever uni question it might be. Um, like, oh, can you transcribe this sentence, you know, phonetically? And I'm here going, oh, great. You know, use, use the sense that's my weakest to do this to get my degree. I'm like, oh, this, this straight up isn't fair. But then I'm able to look and say, you know, oh, this person's done it. This person's done it. This person's done it. And they've all had a hearing loss. Oh shit! You know what? Like, what's stopping me? You know, I just go, wow. You know, it it hasn't stopped them. It why does it have to stop me? So I think uh, it. You know, some people might call me biased, but I think you know, showing and introducing kids to uh, deaf or hard of hearing mentors, it, it it can go a long way. Yeah. That, that that's a lovely segue into my next question about mentoring because I do hear that you do a bit of mentoring um in in you know in these recent years um how how do you find how do you find you know how do you find time to do it like and where where's your drive and what's your passion in terms of wanting to do that mm -hmm. well I mean where do I find the time look I don't know if I had a superpower it'd be to add more hours to a day um but in terms of the passion and, and the drive, I mean, come on. I, I think it, it really comes naturally to me at this point. Um, I, I've chosen to, like, you know, base my whole career, my whole life around improving, you know, uh, the experience of, you know, having a hearing loss. And, you know, I've, I've only recently just started, you know, face-to-face -face mentoring, you know, with the whole COVID thing. But I, I've, you know, had maybe you know, three or four different sessions uh, with the same kids in a row. And, you know, I can say to myself, you know, I've been there. I wish I had someone who I could ask this. And whenever a kid asks me a question in regards to, oh, what did you do in this situation? I'm more than happy, to, you know, to give my answer. Because, you know, I've been there. And I feel like I completely understand what they're going through. So if I can improve you know, one situation for one kid, then, you know, I've already done my job. And, you know, I will keep doing this for as long as I possibly can. And, you know, extending, you know, through to my professional career as well. So yeah, uh, completely normal. That's great. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm just mindful of not keeping you too long. Um, just out of, you know, just out of curiosity, what would, you know, if there's one advice you could give to the kids that you mentor or any kids that, you know, out there that, ha um, that is hard of hearing, what would be, you know, your, your, your little gem that you want to, you want them to know? Right. Well, um, it's a little bit cheap because I've just copied and pasted this from uh, my, uh, my, my podcast episode with RADBC, but it is to make sure that you build up those around you um, which means, you know, know how to advocate, know the right people and make sure the people that you want to have, you know, good relationships with, whether that be your friends and, and whatnot, um, make sure they're the right people because by having a strong support network around you with or without a hearing loss, it helps you build yourself up, right? And at the end of the day, um, your dreams don't work unless you do. And by having having that strong support network, it makes it so much easier to 
uh, have confidence in yourself, to have that drive in yourself, and to achieve what you want to achieve. So um, if there's one takeaway that, that I would give to you know every kid that I go past, it, it'd be that, plain and simple. That's a that's a great nugget right there. Now, what about for us us oldies, <laughs> for the parents, carers, and people who are <laughs> and Bruce <laughs> there? <laughs> um, what 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 would be one advice or one you know even words of comfort, I suppose, um, or anything that you've got to to give to us that we can, you know, mm -hmm. whilst they're caring for someone that's hard of hearing. Look, guys, um, I think the most important thing is uh to first off um you know acknowledge that yes all the emotions and feelings that you've um had and are going to experience are completely valid um there are many people who have been through it you know before you and they've all had to say the same thing so don't don't you worry at all um it's completely normal to have those emotions um next it would be to obviously be, you know, you guys are the parents, you know your kids the best. So take on board whatever a medical professional has to say, whatever your support workers have to say, whatever, uh, you know, maybe even your family has to say, take that on board, yes. But at the end of the day, you guys know your kids best. And if if the school district is saying, no, I don't think, you know, I need to do, but they, like, they need to implement this, you know, don't be afraid to stick your neck out there for, um, for your kids. However, at the same time, the best way to do that is to empower your kids and make sure they feel comfortable in advocating for themselves, in standing up for themselves, and for them to understand their own hearing loss. Because by doing that, you make your job a thousand times better. So, just a quick cheesy takeaway. I know, I know you've all heard it before, but um, from my point of view, it rings completely true. So take of that what you will. Um, and as always, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to share my contact details as well. Uh, you guys have a strong support network around you. Um, you know, with Aussie Deaf Kids just being one of the many uh, that we have access to here in Australia. So make sure you um, you reach out and you uh, you use them all because um, it's not a journey that you guys have to go through alone. And it's not something, you know, that your kids deserve to go through alone as well. Yeah. So yeah. thank yeah. you, Stephen. And just, you know, would it be fair to say that maybe the first step to teaching our children self-advocacy is actually using our ears to listen to them first and then and I then mean... <laughs> and then kind of you know helping them in that way would would you say cuz i kind of hear you you there's a lot of communication that you you encourage um mm -hmm. yeah. definitely i i do encourage uh communication a lot um i know from a parental uh point of view a lot of that um maybe in your minds would be a one way one way street you know, um, kids, you know, they're, they're young, they're naive. Um, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're the ones hearing through their ears. So it's important to hear, hear them, listen to their concerns and support them in any way that you can. Um, but if you get that two way commu uh, communication going, it promotes a very healthy understanding of their hearing loss, um, both for yourself as well as for them because it, it helps them uh bounce ideas and things off you uh even e even if it doesn't look like it even if it doesn't look like it i promise you um it helps them understand their their own hearing loss a bit better yeah. and last but not least is there anything you like to say to those who have supported you you know to become the wonderful young man you are and all the future you know all the future dreams and you know, pediatric audiology, here, here you go, kind of anyone oh, you mate. want to thank or any groups of people you want to thank before we call it wow. a night? Wow, wow, wow. I mean, th this is the easiest part of my night. I mean, come on. Um, obviously, I've got to thank my parents, you know. Um, they they have been there uh, every step of the way. 
as I'm sure you guys will be as well. Um, all the audiologists, all the clinicians, all the speech pathologists, um, obviously they've got their roles to play. And, you know, if they're practicing here in Australia, you know, they are some of the best in the world already. So having, having that support network definitely gives you a, a great backbone to ensure that your kids are hearing as well as understanding the best that they can. Um, having amazing teachers just like we do here in Australia, make sure that, you know, no child is left behind. No child is, you know, at a disadvantage because of, you know, they, so what if they can't hear um, as great as everyone else, you know? Um, they will find a way to make sure that, you know, they don't fall behind. Um, as well as that, internally support teachers, you know, they, they are the glue that hold the whole kind of uh, education uh, kind of like system together, you know, you, you've got communication between the parents, the principal, uh, any teachers, any learning support coordinators, you know, they they hold it all together. Um, but obviously I'm, I'm forgetting a whole bunch of people, you know, my own mentors that I, I've had growing up and um, I won't mention all of them by name because we'll be here till midnight. Uh, but yes, um, hopefully that's just a, a brief fr uh, framework that I can give you guys, you know, as to who to incorporate and ultimately how to incorporate them as well to make sure that your child's journey is, you know, as, as smooth and as easy as possible. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's really been such a wonderful time chatting to you and you've given you know, me a lot of encouragement and hopefully our listeners and uh, people who have joined us tonight. Um, we just like to thank you for your time. And, you know, I, I can't think of, you know, anyone that I, you know, would want to mentor my child even, but, you know, maybe at four, he might just be a bit too young to have these deep conversations with you. <laughs> so we'll hand, we'll hand everything back over to Anne because I, we're one minute over. <laughs> yeah. I just want to thank you so much, Stephen, for your insights. I think they're just so um, incredibly helpful. And um, the fact that this has been recorded, we can encourage other young kids to, to watch it and to learn from your experiences. I think it's also really, um, I'm really grateful that you put your parents at the top of the list because I think as parents we all um, have that, need for um, <laughs> affirmation I guess so I really appreciate that and thank you Flora for um, for leading this and having this chat with um, Stephen um, thank you so much um, apologies because I did mess up the um, I did something with the zoom details um, but fortunately we'll be able to um, put it up on our website and um, so that everybody will be able to enjoy it, Stephen. Thank you so much for your time and for both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hope everyone has a wonderful night. Yep. See you later. Take care. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Stephen. Bye. Gotcha, guys.